Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner and today I am privileged to be joined by one of Forbidden Planet's head book by Laura Dodds, favourite authors of all time, the Mackenzie Lee. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah, I'm 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 happy for you to to join us, particularly at this moment when you are just about to publish The Nobleman's Guide to Scandal and Shipwrecks, the concluding chapter of your Montague sibling series. Am I right? Is this going to be is the end of it for now? It is the end. In my mind's eye, I I always refer to it as a trilogy, but but it's not really, I guess because of the novella, it's not really it's more of a series <laughs> than a trilogy, right? Well, and they're not they're not books that really rely on you having read the first one to understand the plot of the second. They all have very standalone plots. So you get like the little Easter eggs and you understand previously established dynamics. But it's kind of three and a half related books. <laughs> yeah, right on. Now now what can you tell me um specifically about the the Nobleman's Guide before we talk about the universe as a whole? Oh, sure. Uh so Nobleman's Guide this is the other reason it's uh, kind of makes for a weird series is that the nobleman's guide is actually set almost 20 years after gentleman's guide to vice and virtue um so at the beginning of vice and virtue the whole thing is set for your readers who don't know the whole thing is set in 18th century england um the first one is about a young aristocrat who is a a uh, little bit of a rake and a rascal and uh he's going on his grand tour of europe with his best friend who he has a kind of secret crush on a crush that he thinks is more secret than it actually is um, and so in that, in that first book, we have the sort of initial conflict that is requiring our, our narrator Monty to like clean up his act for the first time in his life is the fact that uh, his, his parents have just had another son and he's never had sort of a challenge to his estate and his title and all of that until now suddenly there's, there's another kid. And so now he's got to get his act together. Um, and so the third book, the second book is about his sister Felicity. And then the third book is about uh, the, 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 the infant from the first book who appears only in Wailing Through the Floorboards. Um, and his name is Adrian and he is the, the youngest of the Montague siblings. And also because small spoilers, but not really, um, both of his siblings end up kind of fleeing their family and abandoning their life as British ar aristocracy. And so he doesn't know they exist. He uh, is, when we, when we run in or come into contact with him at the start of the book, he's just about to take his father's seat at parli in parliament and he is a very uh, passionate radical and his father is a very passionate conservative and there's a little bit of conflict there. And also Adrian is a deeply anxious, introspective person who is very concerned about uh, ruffling feathers and really struggles to voice these political opinions he feels so strongly about, especially because they're in contrast to his father's. Um, and also his mother has just died and he becomes convinced slash hooks on to a mystery surrounding her death and an encounter she had many years ago with legendary ghost ship, the Flying Dutchman. So it's it's a very like tropey historical adventure novel. I always, like with, if you like the first two, it's just kind of more of the same. Yeah. And they're just, they're, they're meant to be sort of fun, rompy historical adventure novels that feature characters that traditionally have not been at the helm of those stories. Yeah, which I think is what's really beautiful about the series, actually, and, and what's tremendously resonant about it. When when did you first have the inspiration to jam those things together, to take <laughs> to take that kind of literally literary adventure history, but look at it through another prism? Well, so I've I've adventure like historical adventure stories, especially the ones that have like a tiny bit of magic and a tiny bit of like anachronistic silliness are my favorite kind of, my favorite kind of stories, whether it's movies or books or anything. I always like, my references are like Indiana Jones and Pirates of the Caribbean and the mom, like, like those fun adventure stories. Um, and so I've always loved that genre. Um, and when I was, when I was in grad, in, actually when I was in undergrad, I lived in the UK for a little bit because I thought I was going to uh, be a professor and wanted to get a PhD and then had a professor, my, my, uh, advising professor told me that I couldn't write my papers like novels and I couldn't write like dialogue for Henry V and Richard III and I was furious about that so I said, <laughs> to try something else but I, I came back to the U.S. and I worked as a teaching assistant for a humanities course that was all structured around the idea of if you were a young person taking your grand tour in the 1700s where would you go and so we would 
the class sort of the whole syllabus was structured around this hypothetical grand tour. So we go to Paris and then we talk about like here's Paris and here's the art and here's the cult and um I'd never heard of this concept of the grand tour, but I just come off doing a, a, being abroad for a couple of years and I traveled a lot while I was in the UK because I'd never been to Europe before and suddenly there's like 15 pound Ryanair flights and I loved it. Um, and I was traveling in the way you only can when you're like 19 and stupid and have no money. And I was fascinated though, by this idea that like, and this is one of the things I love about history is how it's so cyclical and people don't really change. And we keep doing the same things over and over again, just in different clothes. And so I loved the grand tour because I was like, oh, in the 18th century, they were also like talking about the transformative power of travel on young people and about like broadening your horizon. And you kind of had a get, it was kind of a gap year for these, for these young men. And so I immediately sort of imprinted on this idea but didn't know that I wanted to write fiction at the time. So I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. So I just sort of like shelved it away as like, maybe someday I will do something fun with a grand tour, whether it's, I, I don't know. I don't know what I thought I was going to do with it, but it just sort of lived rent free in my mind for a long time. Um, and then when I, after I have another book, the first one I, I sold that uh, was wildly unread. And so in the sort of interim after that one had come out and had failed, um, I was struggling with trying to figure out how to be an author and uh, how to be a writer when you're also an author because there's like a business component now and uh, wanted to write something that was just for fun and joyful and for me and had everything I loved in it and also featured characters who I wished I saw in my adventure stories that I loved and characters who often all three of the Montagues I think um, have some re represent some aspect of me that I have not all and my identity that I have not always found joy and happiness in and so it's sort of been for me an act of sort of reclamation of my identity and my history in that way too um and yeah I just wanted to write like a silly fun adventure novel and then somehow it got published yeah that was a long answer for your question I'm so sorry it's, a, it's I love answers like yours. They're far more better. They're far more better. My my grammar's completely deserted me. They're far better than the the Robert Mitchum esque yup answers where you've then <laughs> got to come up with a hundred questions. Yep. Never I, get it. I'm much get it. yeah. One question and a very long answer. I love that. So it seems to me that another thing that um, that that really comes across in in your writing that very much comes across when you chat with you like this is that and that joyful aspect of what you do I think is such a big part of the experience of of reading your novels on the page, and um, it was that a, it was that a very deliberate choice? Is it just something you you couldn't suppress? It had to be there. Is it just is that part of your literary experience? How do you feel about that? I don't know. Um, I definitely went in. So my first book is called This Monstrous Thing, and it's a steampunk imagining of Frankenstein. It is very serious. Uh, and sort of the whole bit, the thrust of the main character is he has no sense of humor and doesn't know how to take a joke. And I think I kind of thought if I was going to write books, they had to be serious. Um, and I hadn't sort of considered the, the sort of power of comedy and the power of things that are fun and funny until I was sort of in my in my depression hole after the book came out and couldn't figure out how to balance these two parts of me in this new like part of my career. And so it really, it, it almost became for me writing, writing things that were fun and joyful became an act of survival in terms of surviving this career and surviving this industry. Cause I had to figure out how to have a good time and not be so bogged down by the, the sort of noise of publishing. Um, but also at the same time, these are the, the first character, the first book is about a bisexual character. The second book is the main character is a woman who wants to be a, a doctor. And then you have Adrian in the third one who has anxiety and OCD and depressive tendencies. And all of those things are things in history that are not associated with joy typically. And when I had, before working on these books, when I had thought of like queer people in history, for example, I always thought of like, well, everybody who was queer before the 90s was like sad and oppressed and could just like, you couldn't, it felt like you couldn't have a life. And I thought of queer history as being something similar to like women's rights that it's like, it slowly gets better over time when really what happens is that it's always getting better and then it gets worse and then it gets better and it gets worse. And the, the queer experience in history is just as varied as it is today. So we know that when we talk about queer people in America today say, we know that your experience as a queer person in America is going to be greatly impacted by your race and your religion and your socioeconomic station and where in the country you live. Like there's all these factors. 
that we don't grant that same individuality to people in history. And so I had a big sort of light bulb moment just as a person in recognizing that history is not just full of queer people, but full of happy queer people who were like getting married and living with people they loved and had lives and careers and were accepted by their community. Like it wasn't all um, Oscar Wilde in, in prison. Yeah, um, yeah. Found, found a lot of joy. Um, but so I had always associated queer history as being sad and punishing and then discovering that there was this whole other joyful side to it. It's like, well, why don't we see this? And it's the same with, with women's history. I'm like, why don't we talk about women who, who found ways to make it work? Why are we always telling stories about oppressed women and women who are sad and unhappy wives? And why are we, why are we, and with mental health, I was like, why are we not even acknowledging the fact that these are not new conditions that are inventions of the 21st century. Like these are conditions that have been around for forever. And so the, the joy came from also just wanting to, to represent that because that's a piece of history that exists that I didn't feel like was out there. And especially in historical fiction, I say this every time I talk, it's, and it's become a not spoiler at this point. Like all of these books have unambiguously happy endings for their characters because they're so tired of queer characters getting either they're always getting tragic endings or they get the like the it's okay like I'm I'm better off than I was at the start of the book but it's still not great like it's still going to be a rough road and I wanted all of these books to just be unambiguously happy good things for the characters I I think that is a fantastic mission to have and a fantastic mission to succeed at which the book that we're talking about here the nobleman's guide to scandal and shipwrecks is available for pre-order from the links attached to this conversation uh, and is a complete summation i think of everything you've just been talking about mackenzie i can see that you've got the uh, the the book behind you could you just could you just push it towards the camera for us for yeah. a second yeah this is yeah actually, look at that fun fact a little peek behind the curtain for your audience because of supply chain issues i have not yet seen the final book so this is a fake dust jacket over somebody else's book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I thought yeah. I thought it was going to be blank pages upon the on, on which the words magically appear if you engage oh. with it in the right way. Oh, that would have been a lot more fun. It'd been great, Dang. right? Yeah. Next a magical maybe when you have your dog on your lap, suddenly the words appear or become <laughs> it becomes the correct it becomes the correct novel. I have a very large dog, so it's hard to have both her and a book on my lap at the same time. <laughs> what, what what breed of dog is she? She's a Saint Bernard. Oh yeah, man, you got. Oh, of course, I knew this. You're a big Saint Bernard lover, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And the Saint Bernard's cameo in the books, because of course they do. Yeah, um, of course. Have you ever seen the Laurel and Hardy film Swiss Miss? Does that mean anything? I've I just. Oh, so I know Laurel but I don't think I've seen that. It's set in the Swiss Alps, clearly it's filmed in, in Burbank, but it was set in, sort of, but there's a, there's a very key scene with the St. Bernard, which is, if you're a St. Bernard lover, you should check that movie out. There's well, a... so this is going a bit off topic, but I'm gonna share it anyway. Um, recently, my dad and I were sitting around at their house going through Disney Plus, trying to find something to watch on, on television. And we saw a thumbnail for a film called My Dog, no, I think it's called My Dog the Thief. And it had just a big St. Bernard. And we were both like, well, immediately we have to watch this. It is the most like insane made for <laughs> 60s about, like, a failing traffic reporter who a, a dog, the St. Bernard, who's a kleptomaniac, steals a diamond necklace from these thieves and he jumps in this traffic reporter's helicopter. And then his helicopter reports become really popular because there's a dog in his helicopter, even though there's no video component to the reports. It's from like, the, it is the wildest terrible movie I've ever seen and I loved every second of it all of this to say I I seek out St Bernard media and I have a very low standard for it if there's a St Bernard in it I will enjoy it I, I love it so if, what's that what's other old Disney film the shaggy dog have you seen that yeah yeah, yeah. and there's there's a sequel the shaggy DA I can't oh, believe I, I know as much as I do about St Bernard movies but now that we're talking about them I really do there's a British film called Digby the biggest dog in the world have you ever seen that no, but I think I need Check to. Check it out. Yeah, dig with it. It's about uh, it's about St. Bernard. Uh, uh, if I remember it correctly, could just be my memory filling in the blanks, who gets hit by some kind of growth ray. So, uh, so yeah. So oh, I okay. might have the breed wrong, but that film definitely exists. I love this. Whether or not it's <laughs> right. Hard. Yeah, this canine exchange. Um, I wish my dog was here, but she's actually much smaller. So, uh, so uh, which is perfect for jumping up in the middle of an interview. But in fact, she's not in the room <laughs> at the moment. 
Um, so before we are exiting the spectacular canine turn we've just taken, um, I was going to ask you about um, your your Marvel series, but Mackenzie, if you don't mind, how do you feel about coming back on another instalment? And we'll chat about those in another episode. I'd love it. I can't wait to find a way to relate St. Bernard's to Marvel. <laughs> I am sure that we Bring will be back. able to do that. But on this note, this has been us talking about the nobleman, the nobles, the nobleman's guide to scandal and shipwrecks, which you can invite, we can buy from the links attached to this interview. Mackenzie, thanks so much for joining me. We love your work, and uh, it's an epic series. And Laura Dodd sends her love. Thank you, and hello to Laura. Take care, mate. All the best. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.